Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated here in the house of the Lord today. What a beautiful turnout on an early, rainy day. Aren't you delighted that tomorrow is March? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I, told, I said Wednesday night, I walked on Monday out at the park and uh, Rocky Gap, and it was because of snowing. I went out in the morning and thought, i got to do this because it's not going to snow again until next February. So I need to take advantage of this now. And had a, just a great time. It was so really, really attractive. I love that, and I know that nobody else is out there with me, and I can just go crazy. All right, we're going to take a couple of moments this morning and pray for Pastor Pete and his family. And I'm going to ask Sister Hannah to come with him and Trey and Isaac to join us as well. Those of you who are on our board, pastors, you can come this morning. Uh, Sister Pam, I always, you know, just if you want to come up here and pray with us, come and pray, okay? <laughs> I don't have a, uh, an expectation or anything like that, but we're delighted. Pastor Pete is our media arts pastor, and Sister Hannah is over at Lighthouse Christian Academy. These two basically just eat everything in sight, the other two, yeah. right? <laughs> That's their job. We know his job and her job, now we know their job. They are a uh, wonderful Family, I'm sorry, I forgot to, I took my mask off to talk and come up here without it. Um, so glad that you guys have been with us six years. For a long time, you may know, they commuted from Hagerstown up here all the time. I uh, came into my office on Friday and said, we've lost the church drone. We have a drone here, I don't know if you know it. But it's only armed with small caliber weapons. And it's only if we get invaded and attacked by zombies. But we had the drone out, I guess, taking pictures of the campus. And the drone, as technology often does, developed a mind of its own. And uh, it flew away. And no matter how much it was commanded to return, it was sending back messages, no, no, I will not return. And you can't make me. And so I was walking yesterday morning. I walked in, in the city and made a loop here and uh, happened to be going down the hill, made a couple of loops going down the hill and saw something sitting up on the roof that seemed very odd. And uh, lo and behold, there was E.T. and he was trying to phone home and say, come and get me. So we were happy to report that the drone is uh, recovered and the technology ministry continues to move forward. We're delighted that these guys have been with us for six years and we're thrilled. Nobody knew a year, year and a half ago where we were headed and had we not been already making a huge investment, both in terms of equipment, but also in manpower within the media arts department, we, our first six months, at least six months of this pandemic would have been hor much more horrible than it was. And we were able to launch online just right away and really have improved our quality over and over, month after month. And I am so appreciative of that. I'm going to have Pastor Pete greet you this morning, then we're going to pray for them. Thank you, Pastor. I want to take a moment and give honor where honor is due. Even though he hates technology and everything that has to do with it, thank you, Pastor Doug, for investing so much into, our, uh, into what we do here. Thank you for being willing to put up with my uh, comments back of just give me a minute. I don't know what's going on. Uh, for those of you who've watched online, for those of you who are watching online right now, thank you for your patience as I learn how to do these things. Um, also, I'd like to also give honor and thanks to the tech team in the back. They are amazing. They do a phenomenal job week after week after week. One Sunday that it was snowing, they couldn't make it. And I learned to appreciate them even more. 
Uh, I'm not an octopus that can stick his arms in seven different directions to hit buttons at, at one time. Um, but we are so thankful, and we are so thankful that you've pulled us in and adopted us as a church family. Uh, we love you. You've put up with my children. And, no, I'm kidding. You've loved on my children and my wife, and we're so thankful for, uh, to call this place home. Thank you. I have just enjoyed being here, and one of the biggest things for me is being um, at Lighthouse, um, because I was a public school teacher for 12 years, and the fact that I get to say Jesus' name in my classroom out loud, that I am teaching my children that when they have belly aches or boo-boos, that they don't have to go to the nurse. They can pray first before going to the nurse, and I just am so thankful for that opportunity, and especially this year, because we have many students who have come in that are um, from our public schools, and so The Lord has just told me to, as long as I have them, I'm going to train them up. If I get to keep them, I'm going to pour into them. And if I don't, I'm going to train them up to be missionaries when they go back into their schools. So I'm just so thankful that the Lord has um, provided, even though this um, pandemic has negative, it also has positive things. And so I just thank you for that. And um, I just thank you for allowing me to pour into your uh, students, both in Lighthouse and with the youth. Amen. Amen. Yeah, many of those kids may go back and be missionaries within their own family. And we are very, very happy about that. And yes, we've tried to emphasize throughout this past year that while we are struggling with many aspects of this virus and pandemic, we're very grateful that Lighthouse Christian Academy and Lighthouse Christian Daycare have flourished through all of this. And we're very thankful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you slip in behind this gang and let's begin to Pray for them today and believe the Lord for them to be blessed and prospered and used mightily. Father, thank you for this family. We so appreciate their partnership with us, their life lived here among us, and their faith, Lord, invested into us. I pray that you would touch them. Lord, we thank you that you're using them here in our midst and how you've constantly used them at the school and here in the church. And Lord, we thank you for their commitment to the things of God. We thank you, Lord, for their steadfastness. They are investing in their own home first, raising up their own boys with the power and presence of God. And then, Lord, investing on all the rest of us. We thank you that they enjoy being here. And Lord, we pray that that joy would multiply and that all of us, Lord, would continue to benefit from that which they put into this place. Thank you for their ministry gifts and talents. I pray that you would multiply those, Lord. Meet every need they have. I pray that you would bless them with health and strength. Prosper them. And Lord, thank you for this church that I know has loved them. Would you bless that back to every brother and sister of mine? Bless it back to them for having given in to the lives of the Duncansons. We appreciate, God, your love for us and your love for them. And Lord, we commit to loving each other more and more until the day of Jesus appears. We thank you for it in his mighty, glorious name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give him a hand this morning. God bless you guys. <clears throat> thank you all. Now listen, we don't, um, we don't do pastor's appreciation. For those of you who are guests this morning, Uh, Maybe you're fairly new here to the church, maybe it's your first day, and if so, thank you, welcome. But we don't do an annual Pastor's Appreciation Day for all. We do an annual on the anniversary of that pastor being hired here at Central. And uh, if you would like to show them a tangible expression of your love, a gift, a financial gift or gift card or anything like that, I encourage you to do that. You can give it directly to them. If you would like credit for your giving, then you can give into the church system, you know, online or in the boxes in the back, however you choose. And you can just designate Pastor Pete. Just know that anything that you run through the church is taxed before they receive it, okay? Um, that's, it doesn't matter to us. We know that some of you benefit from having those tax deductions, and we want you to do that, all right? But I encourage that. Please feel free. And you can do that any time throughout the month, but we'll make sure that they get it no matter what. All right. <clears throat> I want to take a couple of moments today and talk about our banquet Saturday night. And I want to encourage you 
to uh, get involved. In the book of Luke, in chapter 13, I want to read to you about, um, oh, it wasn't, oh, no, 14, verse 12. Luke 14, 12. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, he meaning Jesus, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors. For they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Now, we're hosting a business appreciation dinner. And you might say, well, Pastor, most business people that I know are not blind or otherwise disabled. But they might be spiritually disabled. And this coming Saturday night, this coming Saturday night, we're hosting a very special banquet, easy schedule. Eat and enjoy it, and then Brother Ken Gobb will share about 20 minutes of his unique brand of humor and inspiration. He will encourage businessmen and women to be successful, to reach for the best goals possible. We encourage that. We love businesses, love businessmen and women, and we want businesses to prosper. Amen? Leading a business is the hardest thing you can do, and we appreciate men and women who take that risk and step out. We especially appreciate believers who do that. Now, what we're doing is encouraging you to bring somebody. So a businessman or woman, we prefer unchurched, but it doesn't have to be, okay? Okay? So we've limited this to 50, and we may even drop that down just a little bit. But there is an absolute hard cap on this. Saturday night down at the Culinary Cafe downtown, the meal is prepared by them. There's plenty of room there for us to social distance, and we're going to have a great evening. The biggest invitation will not be to become religious or even follow Jesus, but to come back to church next Sunday morning, And hear Brother Ken again, where he will say, why don't you follow Jesus? (laughs) Amen. So what I want you to do is to be blessed in bringing. You're going to do half the work, and the church is going to do the other half. You're going to make the invitation. You're going to put the pressure on. You're going to pick them up at their door if you have to and drop them off downtown. You can't drop them off at the door because that's a a pedestrian area only down there. But you're going to do all that, and we're going to pay for it for you. And them? What kind of deal is that? Now, how many of you, who right now, by show of your hands, you know a businessman or woman? Now, they can be, they can own a business that has no employee, just them, self-employed. They can employ 25 people. They can be in the medical profession or they can be in the legal profession. They can have their office or a clinic. You, You might think of them as just a professional, but that business Doc's dental practice is not just him being a dentist. He has multiple staff members there. So there's the dental provision, the service, but there's also the business that he's running. How many of you know somebody like that? Okay, who here this morning would say, I want to see your hands. Pastor, I want, please make sure I get some of those tickets after the service this morning because I know exactly who I want to invite. Who is that this morning? I've only got, I think, 15 here. Brother Rick. Who else this morning? Come on, how, how good is this? This is as good as it gets, right? You're being given something. Thank you, Sister Mary Jane. Yes, thank you, Brother Mandela. Okay, so you guys make sure. If I'm occupied at the end of the service, Pastor Adam, my tickets will be up here if you run out. But you see Pastor Adam, okay? He and I will have these. We're going to have a delightful time. Listen, you've still got a day, but we have to cut this thing off tomorrow. So when you call here on Thursday and say, I, I don't remember, I wasn't paying attention on Sunday to what pastor said, but I want to come to that dinner. Too late. All right? I'm taking precious time. This is my time I'm taking. I don't like when people take my time. You know how valuable this is to me if I'm taking my time, right? So please get in on this. I believe that in the year that we've had, businessmen and women need our support more than ever. They need to know, not just that we come there and buy something from them, but they need to know that we appreciate the sacrifices they make and the risk that they take 
every single day. I saw um, a store yesterday, or a whole network of stores, um, some music uh, in the malls. Fry or something, fire, fry, and they all they just bankrupt. It's not easy. You can make a lot of money if you know what you're doing, but if everything turns sideways, you might lose a lot of money. Let's support businessmen and women and get them in the kingdom. Amen. All right, there you go. Turn your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Yes, you heard me right. It will pay for you and them. Praise God. I'm already excited about it. Um, And I forget what it is that we're having. Some great dinner. Romans chapter 5, and look at verse 1 this morning. Romans 5 and 1. We're finishing the month of February, the month of relationships, right? Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. I love that phrase. Undeserved privilege. There are a lot of people that are using that word privilege in a very negative connotation today, throwing it around in the American culture. This person is privileged. That group of people are privileged. Glory to God. I am privileged and proud of it. Now, I didn't deserve any of it. It has nothing to do with this life or this world. But because of God's grace and favor, I have undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Now, Part of what we want to look at today is why. Why are we so confident about the future? Verse 3, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Wow. Paul had to explain that because we're talking about the future of glory and presence of God. We're not going to have any trials and problems then. So when we run into those now, we can rejoice, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Now you're going to see the same kind of language when you're reading 2 Peter chapter 1. And it's amazing that these two guys had such different ministries, but how much they conveyed was parallel. That's because of what? The Holy Spirit. Right? Paul and Peter had completely different backgrounds, and yet you see the same kind of language. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Praise God. Are you full? That's what I'm going to ask you today. Are you full? our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Are you full? Now, a lot of people read this and say, well, um, I have to be because the Bible says I am. But that's not the posture, that's not the position from which God wants us to see this. He doesn't want us to have to say by faith, well, I, I need to say that I'm full because the Bible says that I am. This is talking experiential. Just like your salvation, you either know you're saved or you know you're not saved, right? You know that you became born again, that you met Jesus Christ, or you know that you did not, you do not, and you want not to be known by him. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. And Paul, the apostles all together, never lead us into a place of saying, you had an experience in salvation, but with the Holy Spirit, it's just got to be guesswork. You just have to believe it by faith. You're never going to feel anything. You're never going to experience anything. Just trust God that you got it. That's not doctrinally correct. It's not experientially correct. Now go to chapter 15. As, as the Holy Spirit is closing out this letter, here are some things that he explains to us. We should be expecting trials and problems, but in all of that, we are confident, not crazy, confident. Now some people get into the church And because they don't have an experience with the Holy Spirit, they end up veering off towards crazy. Whole lot of crazy out there. Right? You don't have to go very far to find crazy. In churches, in the streets, in the marketplace. Crazy's everywhere. 
Some of us don't even want to come out of our house anymore because we don't want to interact with crazy. But we're confident. So we look to the Holy Spirit for a powerful filling. Verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number one, are you full to overflowing? Am I full to overflowing? Now, this is one of the things that causes us to recognize here that Paul is talking about something, and I, I hate to, to use him because we know it's the Holy Spirit, but I, I don't know how else to say it because he is the human author. And what he's focusing on here is a filling that causes us to overflow. And this is what he says. Notice again, back from chapter 5, he pulls back in that confidence, the need for us to have confidence. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happens when we have an encounter with the Holy Spirit is we begin to have a hope in what God is doing. It's not based on what we see around us. We don't care about the things happening around us. We know we have to live. We have to make decisions. We have to interact with this world, but we're not of this world. We don't get discouraged when things don't go our way. We don't give up in depression when things are overwhelming and opposing us, but we remain confidently hopeful because Jesus Christ came and said, don't worry about what's going on. When I go, I'm coming back. When I leave, I'll revisit. When I'm not here with you physically, I'll make sure somebody else is. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power, being completely full. God, God's science is different than our science. His um, physics works differently than our physics. When God talks about full, he never means this much and no more. God always speaks of fullness as overflowing. Now, almost everything in our life, when it's overflowing, we're in trouble, right? If you're in your bathroom and the bathtub's overflowing, that's not good. Let me tell you something worse when the commode's overflowing, right? Man, you're talking about a three-alarm emergency then, huh? Come on, everybody's been there, and you're like, oh, this is horrible. So many times in life, we think of overflowing as a really bad deal. You know, if you're living near a lake, a man-made dam, and it, they begin to talk about, we're worried about it overflowing. And you're like, I don't care about it overflowing. I just don't want it to push all that dirt out of the way. Remember a year or two ago there out in California? And they had that huge water dam there. And that water came up and then around, and then it just started making its own exit. And the more it exited, the more earth it took with it. And they were telling everybody around, get ready, it's just going to go. And maybe some of you are familiar with the uh, Johnstown flood of uh, 100 and some years ago and the devastation that it brought. We think of overflowing, and we usually think, oh, that's not good. But God says, when I fill you, it's always an experience that's to be overflowing. Now, we struggle with that because it's not just in physics and science, but our human nature tends to reject overflowing. If you eat too much and you begin overflowing, that's, ooh. Hmm? But God says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. So we often, in working with God, in walking with God, we want to experience, and we don't mind being full, but we prefer not, as a matter of fact, often fight to not be overflowing. Because overflowing is always observed by the people gathered around. In Acts chapter 2, they were in the upper room, and the doors were not just shut, locked. Now, they were praying, and Jesus had told them, when you pray, go into your closet and close the doors behind you, and God, who sees you in secret, will reward you in secret. 
He'll reward you privately. He'll reward you so that nobody else knows. Ha! Huh? Jesus said when you go in there, some of you are saying, yeah, that's exactly what he said. No, that's not what he said. He said when you go in there and the doors are shut behind you and you are praying secretly and having your time with God privately, God will reward you openly. And they were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 and they had the doors not only shut but scared to death. They've killed him, killed our leader. They're going to come after us. So they've got the doors locked. But all of a sudden a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and then tongues of fire and the Holy Ghost filled every one of them. Somehow baby, the doors opened up. Somehow everybody out there heard what was going on because when God fills you, he'll overflow you so that others can see what God is doing in you. They know what you've been doing in you. They know your limitations. They've been with you when you got stuck, got sideways, went upside down, but they want to see God working through you and the only way they can do it is when you close yourself in with him privately and he begins to fill you privately until you overflow glory to God are you full to overflowing now this is a state that automatically produces giving <laughs> you just can't help it when, when you begin to be overflowed it's a state of giving. The next chapter in Acts, Peter and John are getting ready to go back for prayer. <laughs> that one was pretty good. Let's go do it again. And they pass a man who's uh, crippled, crippled in his legs. And the Bible says that he had been brought to that gate for decades. Jesus had passed by that gate time after time. For some reason, that wasn't his day, but this was. How many of you are confident that your day's coming? Huh? You're confident. I don't know if it's yesterday, today, or tomorrow, but my confidence in the Lord tells me that just like the man in Acts chapter 3, my day is going to come as well. And so he, he's there, and Peter and John walk by, and what do they say? Hey, we don't have anything to put in your little cup there. We don't have anything to throw down in the box. We've got nothing, not silver, not gold, but we've got something you're going to like. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Bam! He's up off that mat. His ankles are strengthened. He's shouting and praising God because whenever you are overflowed, you begin to give. And I know it because I lead a church that gives. I lead a church that just helped wipe out the medical debt of the entire, the delinquent medical debt of the entire state of Maryland. Hallelujah. Did you see that report the other day? that the billionaires of America give on average 1% and the average non-billionaire gives 2%? <laughs> come on, that's a day of rejoicing, every one of you. Yeah, come, no matter how much you give. Now listen, if you're walking with God, two brings a tear to your eye. Hello? Two, 2% two just puts you in the, in the realm of being self-condemned. I'm not talking about God's condemnation. I'm not talking about my condemnation. You do that as a believer, and all you're going to feel is guilt and condemnation. Come on. You're talking about salvation from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're talking about him who can meet every need, cause you to not, over, not only overflow in the spirit, but overflow in prosperity. And, and who knows? You might give 8, 10, 12 percent. Walk out in the car and find out that somebody dropped that lottery ticket right down in your car. And there you got three quarters of a billion dollars. You better give. But then we give, on average, I, it was, I don't know, some of the leading newspapers had this week. I don't know if it was Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg. 2% or 1%, but the average American gives too. Now the believers, I know, I, I don't know your giving, but I know when I see you. And listen, that doesn't mean I discern it or I can tell. I just know that you're giving people. Many of you, you've told me, you, you love giving. 10% tithe and offerings beyond that. So you're probably giving 12, 14, 15% a year, maybe more. Praise God. Because when you are full to overflowing, it brings you to a state of giving. You just give. And I don't mean just your wallet. You're going to pray over the next 30 days. And you're going to be giving some of the greatest offerings that the world could ever know. And that's 
the offering of prayer for lost people, prayer for people who have never heard the name of Jesus, prayer for safety for our team and for all of God's goodness. All right, here's the second thing. I could stay there for the rest of the day, but I don't want to spend all my three hours right there. Verse 14, I'm fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. Do you see we're focusing on the word full here? You are full of goodness. You know these things so well, you can teach each other all about them. Even so, I've been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Spirit. Number one, are you full to overflowing? Number two, are you full with goodness? Are you full with goodness? And he says there in verse 14 that you are full of goodness. You know everything so well you could be teaching each other. But Paul mentions something here somewhat convicting, somewhat exposing. And what he's saying is much like the author in Hebrews is that we can't keep going over the basics again and again. Paul says you know these things so well that you could be teaching, but even though you are knowing, you still need to be reminded. Because if we don't understand what fullness in God means, if we don't fully understand it and lay hold of it, we're going to forget it. And we can have all the head knowledge that we want. You can know all the scriptures. You can know all the church events. You can know the lingo and you can know the walk and you can know the people who attend here and where they sit and you can know the technology that we use. You can know all of that and not be full. So Paul is really drilling down with us here and trying to help us understand you and I have to be full of goodness and that goodness brings us to a state that produces having, having. We have the fullness in us. We have it. I am fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. You have this, the apostle saying. The Holy Spirit is reminding us, but it should flow out in goodness to others. We're going to take a few minutes here and talk about something. If you have the New Living Study Bible that we have here at the church that we sell. You don't have to have this Bible, but it's what I preach from, and it's a, it's a great tool. It's not the most exhaustive study Bible, but it's got some good stuff in it. And you'll notice several words footnoted in my text today. And those footnotes will take you over. They're actually in the center column. Most of them are. And then they take you to the back, and they help you to understand what that word meant in the Hebrew of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New One of the words you're going to see in here, if you go to it in the back of your Bible in the study guide, you're going to see that it references a a moral goodness. It directs us to understand the importance of how we live. It's not just being like a good person, but it means good in our interchanges and exchanges with others. As you're reading through the Old Testament, most of you are reading through with us. I've done lots of surveys, and my assessment from all of that is that the vast majority are reading through one of the things that you should have noticed, how dramatically God spells out the issues concerning our sexual lives. It is almost rated R. In some places, it really is. If you made a movie about all that God was defining and saying to stay away from, we'd have to put an R, I guess an R rating, I don't know, or maybe, there's, maybe you put X on it, I'm not sure. Now God did these things because he certainly understood what mankind was capable of. So I'm going to take that and talk a little bit about the spiritual part of this. You, you should have read the story about Balak hiring Balaam to curse God's people. Isn't it fascinating how much real estate that takes up? When we're talking about God's people coming into the land of promise, leaving the land of Egypt, coming into Canaan's land, I find it fascinating that God takes chapters to talk 
about this one that he said immediately to Balaam, do not go with these guys. Do not go to curse my people. Do not travel with them. But Balaam decided that he wanted to uh, negotiate with God. So finally God says, yeah, go ahead. But don't say anything I don't tell you to say. There's that great exchange back and forth. He blesses them, blesses them. And the third time it says that because he knew the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him, Balaam did not use divination as he had in the past. And so then he does this incredible prophecy at the end. Israel is blessed. The tents are blessed. Everybody in the nation is blessed. And you can't unbless them. He closes it with prophesying over some other nations. And the Bible says that he and Balak go home. The next chapter you read is that the children of Israel fall into unbelievable sin with the Moabites and Midianites. And we don't know how that happened until later. We find out that Balaam, having prophesied, having had the Spirit of God speak through him, the Spirit of God fill him to overflowing, Balaam decides, well, Listen, I can get both here. I can get God's blessing on his people, and I can get Balak's money for my efforts. I'm going to get a twofer here, right? And so he, we're not told all the details, but obviously he says to Balak, let me tell you how to get God mad at his people. Let me tell you how to get them upside down with God. All you've got to do is pull them into sin. All you've got to do is allow your people to sexually infiltrate that people and it'll all be over. Now, the danger with this is that as Christians we often act like in churches and you know because we're in God's house. We want to be so careful about the things we talk about because in the Old Testament, God said, I want you to build an earthen ramp up to the altar, no steps, so that I don't see, you know, those guys wore the long robes. He said, I don't want to see any nakedness when you step up on the steps or it will defile my altar. So we're dealing with a God who was very, very specific about nudity. He was also a God who every once in a while, it appears, a lot of people died when they got close to him. So you can understand why the people, not only in those days, but today, are reluctant in church to talk about things. But gang, if we don't, if we don't, every generation, if we don't bring to God's house the truth of what he's trying to do, here's the truth of it. God wants to protect us. Always he's trying to protect his people. Always. And the devil wants to destroy us. Now, he has an advantage in this life. The devil does. Because everything in us that feels good, everything that makes us feel good, is oriented with our flesh. Oriented, rooted in this world. And so the enemy has leverage. But what he does not have is conviction. Glory to God. I mentioned last week one of the really giants in the evangelical world. And I don't know if you went home then looked up. I told you not to do it while I was preaching, but maybe you did then too. But, um, Ravi Zacharias, who was probably the church's most well-known and most successful apologist. He debated, he was loved on the university campuses, debated young people and scholars, debated Muslim scholars and atheist scholars, and constantly defended God's word. But there it appears, and I've read the report, the attorney's report that was sanctioned, hired, retained to investigate after his death a lot of charges that were leveled against him. Unfortunately, um, he, he didn't, wasn't here to himself defend them, but they had been being leveled at him for three or four years. And I, I just want to emphasize, gang, we're all in this flesh. We're all subject to falling and failing in a thousand different ways. And if we don't plug into the Holy Spirit to full and overflowing, to full and, and good, when we interact with other people and they leave our presence, are they saying it was good to have talked to him or her? 
and sexual sin, sexual violation, rape, assault, manipulation, these things create such openings for the demonic kingdom of Satan to, to just march right in. When you look at the Old Testament, you're looking at pictures, mostly. Pictures, if you want to hear my take on this. Pictures that you and I get to look at involving people that give us an understanding of the unseen realm. So when the Midianites and Moabites, cousins of the Israelites, when they seduced them, it was a picture of Satan's forces, demonic spirits of rape, demonic spirits of manipulation, demonic spirits of sexual assault, demonic spirits of pornography, demonic spirits of addiction. So you get the picture that whenever that is welcomed, whenever it happens and it's unwelcomed, as in the case of assault or rape. When that happens, what's that door that God has, that, that wall that he puts around people, every person, every human being, that door is, is just explode, uh, uh, just bombed and, and flies off the hinges. And now that person, perhaps that youth, has this marching band of demonic thoughts, fears, anxieties. And as a nation, we've decided that instead of addressing it and trying to bring healing, and I'm talking generally, as a nation, we've decided we'll allow people to self-medicate and we can see how well that's working out. I don't have any time. Are you full with goodness? This is a state that automatically produces having. I have what I need in Jesus. Pastor, you don't understand. I need, uh, I want somebody in my life. I need a mate. I need a wife or a husband. Or I need somebody in a same gender relationship with me. You don't understand what I need. When you have the fullness of the Holy Ghost, he brings Jesus to you and you know that you have everything you need. That's the gospel, my friend. It's not just make-believe. It's not made up. It's not superstition. It's not we hope until we get there or we fake it until we make it. If you haven't met Jesus that way, then you find an altar. You build an altar in your home, in your car, in your bathroom or in your basement. You go somewhere and you get with God until you don't come out. When you come out, you've met Jesus. We, uh, Pam and I were newly married, and I, we were starting in evangelism, and I, I just wanted a touch from God. I went to a church that she had been in as a young person, a church of God, Pentecostal church of God, and I said to the pastor, I want to go in here and I want to pray until I'm done, and I don't want anybody to bother me. I don't care how many days it takes. And I went in that night, and the next night at midnight, literally at midnight, a bolt of lightning hit, struck, and I was... I was at a point where I was really having a time with God, and I'm telling you, it was for me. And that next morning when I came out of there, I knew I had been with Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, that experience is not limited to people who are called. Pastor, I don't have that kind of time. You'll get that kind of time when you get desperate. Pastor, I just can't afford that. I can't stay awake. I can't stay alert. I'm not telling you that it's going to take you 36 hours. But what I'm telling you is, Jesus said, if your right hand's offending, you cut it off. That's how desperate you have to be for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And when we are like that, we'll get it. Now we're going to, uh, tonight I'm going to share some things with you because I, I believe we need time as a church to go after him again. And I'm going to ask your opinion about when, what night each week we can go after him. Amen. Glory to God. Here's the third thing, chapter 15, verse 17. I'm sorry, I took too much time in my announcement. Now I'm buying it back from you. Uh, 17, so I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. And let me also say that the other picture is that when you have been wounded, broken, robbed because of sexual assault, he's the healer. Jesus Christ is the healer. The greatest 
signs and wonders he can do in America right now are not, is not healing paralyzed or blind people in America. The greatest signs and wonders is when he heals people who have been sexually traumatized, who have had their lives ruined, everything in their childhood stolen from them, assaulted as a young person or even an adult. And when Jesus Christ comes and shows his healing power, it makes people shout. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. All right, 17 again. I just don't want to leave you out there in negative land without telling you that Jesus understands. Jesus heals. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God, yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message. And by the, by the way, I worked among them. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs. Notice that word convinced in the New Living, very close to conviction, right? Because God owns conviction. The devil does not. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Number three today, are you full by the Holy Spirit? Number one, are you full to overflowing? Number two, are you full with goodness? And number three, are you full by the Holy Spirit? He says, listen, there are signs and wonders, healings and miracles and deliverances, but there is also the powerful sign of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when they saw that, Paul saying, everywhere I go, I show them the power of the Holy Spirit, not just in people being healed, not just in people being set free, but I show them the power in their own life of being baptized in the Holy Spirit just like I was. When they see that, well, pastor doesn't say that. It does say that. That's exactly what it says. Look, they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders. That's all the gifts working in others. And by the power of God's Spirit. That, my friend, is him working in you. Him working in me. It's not a healing or a, a, a miracle deliverance. It's something altogether unique to me. It's my experience with the Holy Spirit. It's my prayer language. It's the anointing. It's the power of God. Who am I? I'm not worthy of the power of God. I never deserve this. Paul said in Romans 5, you and I don't deserve it, but we have a glorious inheritance. We are confident that Jesus is coming back because we've got the Holy Spirit working in us right now. If you have the knowledge, congratulations. But I want to remind you today, like Paul reminded the Romans, that knowledge puffs up. But it's the Holy Ghost who brings a fullness that the world craves and needs. It's the Holy Spirit and nothing else. This state automatically produces receiving. Hallelujah. We've had the state of giving, the state of having, but now the state of receiving. Praise God. That's what he wants for you, is to receive. Paul said, everywhere I go. Do you know the, how much territory he just mentioned there? Do you know how, the distance of Europe that he just covered in Asia? Do you know what he just said there? And everywhere I go. They see signs and wonders, healings, people set free. They see all kinds of crazy stuff, but they also see the power of the Holy Ghost booming inside of them, flowing out of them, a fullness to overflowing. And I want to encourage you today, may you have that fullness to overflowing. Come on, stand with me this morning. Stand with me as we begin to say to the Lord, oh, may that fullness be ours today. May that fullness be ours today. Uh, come on, slip one hand up or both or bow your heart before him, however you want to do it. But as you prepare to be in his presence now, you've had a time for worship. You and I have journeyed through the word. Now let's walk into the holy of holies. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for this holy place. Thank you for the holy of holies where the spirit of the living God wants to fill us to overflowing so that we can be givers, so that we can be havers, but most of all, so that we can be receivers. Glory. May we be recipients of the Holy Ghost and power. May we be recipients of the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders. May we receive today the Holy Spirit and prayer. Prayer languages. Prayer songs. 
prayers of praise and worship, prayers of adoration. Because we are full of confidence, Jesus, that you're getting ready to come back. We are full of confidence today that you're getting ready to come back. We are full of confidence. We are not ashamed when people ask us. We're not out there being crazy, Lord, because you didn't call us to be crazy. You called us to be confident. But we're not afraid to tell people, absolutely, I'm confident. I didn't have any confidence the other guy was going to be president. I didn't have any confidence this guy. That's in the hands of God. But this I know. Jesus Christ is coming back one day, and he will rule and reign. We've only got a minute this morning, one literally a minute, but I want to give you the opportunity to pray for healing this morning, to seek healing. I want to give you this chance to be prospered today. If you're struggling financially, that God would give you a word about prosperity. If you are seeking an encounter with the Holy Spirit, I want to give you the chance to have that happen. We're going to open this altar up, the altar. Hallelujah, the altar. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And you're going to slip in if you'd like to. You can keep your mask on, you, whatever. And you slip into this altar. I may come and pray for you. I'll have my mask on. I may come and lay hands on you. If I do, I'll just lay my hands on your shoulder. I only touch you on the fabric of your clothes. But I may, I may not. It just depends. But I want you to feel good about coming in to God's presence and saying, Lord, do this great thing in me. Whatever it is you need, God, I'm believing. I have confidence that you're going to do this. As I pray, the altar's open. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, why don't you do that today? If you've run away from him and you're here today because you know you need to come back, why don't you run back to him? Come on, he's right where you left him. If you've been saying to God, I think I'm okay, I I think everything's fine, but I want all my attention focused on this world, God's saying to you today, no, my friend, you're not promised tomorrow. Make sure that you're ready to meet me today. Now, as I pray, the altar's open. Why don't you slip in here and let God begin to minister to you. Whoever you are, believer, come, and the unbeliever will come with you. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you today for doing a great work here among us, Lord. We worship you as the King of glory, and we have confidence in you that you are meeting our needs and that one day you're going to meet us in the air. We have confidence in you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, if you have a need this morning, slip into this altar. Let's take two minutes.